for communism, an introduction to the politics of the internationalist communist tendency. Uh, this is part two, so it'll be chapter three, four, and five. Chapter three, the struggle for class autonomy. The bourgeoisie has a great interest in using differences in the working class to divide it. Workers who stand in a competitive relation to each other and at loggers, loggerheads with themselves do not defend themselves against oppression. A divided working class is a welcome object of exploitation and, in the final analysis, is cannon fodder for the wars of the imperialist age. The ruling class is also able to rely on various ideologies and a whole network of traditional relations of domination. These forms of oppression already existed in previous class societies, but under capitalism have taken on a modified shape corresponding to the interests of the system. Framing and maintaining the divisions within the working class into local and foreign, men and women, hetero and homosexual, etc., is central to the security of the ruling class. The stirring up of prejudice and bigotry has always been an important ideo ideological weapon of the bourgeoisie. It is all the more important for communists to resolutely stand up against all forms of oppression and the manifold ideological mystifications of class domination. Nationalism and the myth of national liberation. In War and Peace, the bourgeoisie tries to make the workers identify with their country. For generations, we have been told that our jobs are in danger and we will lose them if we don't work even harder. Exactly the same message is rammed down the throats of workers everywhere. In time of war, they also call for us to be slaughtered and or to massacre our class brothers and sisters for the good of the country. The idea of the nation is a decisive prop for bourgeois domination. It disguises the class character of the system and makes it appear as if the existing order is the expression of the common interest of the people. Nationalism always means the submission of the proletariat to its own bourgeoisie. In the age of imperialism, in which the rule of capital grips the entire globe, the concept of specific national possibilities of development and unfulfilled democratic tasks is absurd and is in every sense reactionary. The internationalist communist left has never supported so-called national liberation struggles. It is often asserted that these struggles are against repression and therefore are anti-imperialist. It is true that in many countries there are oppressed minorities but these minorities can gain nothing by identifying with their own ruling class or parts of the bourgeoisie. Demanding that the working class participates in a national movement means leading them into capitalism's abattoir. These struggles are equally not anti-imperialist. Nationalist movements are dependent on finding sponsors and supporters in the imperialist power structure merely in order to be able to develop military firepower. Even a newly liberated state after a successful struggle for independence will not be able to withdraw from the network of imperialist relations, which make up the world economy. No state today can develop independently and outside the demands of capitalist competition on the world market. We answer those who endlessly argue that Marx supported certain independent struggles or that Lenin championed the right of nations to self-determination by saying that such mechanical Marxism has nothing to do with Marxism. Marx wrote at a time when capitalism was in its infancy, creating a working class, new technologies and machines. Against this background, Marx and Engels supported those national movements, which they believed would speed up the triumph over feudal and pre-capitalist structures. In that ascendant phase of capitalism, there was still room for maneuver for the formation of independent capitalist states, and with that for the further development of the working class, the future gravedigger of capitalism. But in the epoch of imperialism, the room for maneuver for national independence is squeezed within narrow boundaries. It was Rosa Luxemburg, not Lenin, who better understood this fact 
despite her erroneous analysis of imperialism's roots. The further development of capitalism since the early years of the 20th century has confirmed the correctness of Luxembourg's position on the national question. Lenin expected that the political struggle of the colonial countries would shake the imperialist powers to their foundations. But in the wake of the decolonization after the Second World War, these hopes were unfulfilled. Decolonization altered little in the economic power structure. In many cases, the independence of the old colonies was the, was the result of an inter-imperialist power struggle as the USA prevailed against the old colonial powers. The bourgeoisie of the peripheral countries may sometimes find themselves in a weaker position in the imperialist pecking order. They may rely on all sorts of anti-imperialist rhetoric and social demagogy, but all of this does not alter the fact they are an integral component part of the global capitalist domination over the working class. For this reason, so-called national liberation movements represent the interests of bourgeois fractions and currents and act as part of an inter-imperialist lineup against the working class. All theories and slogans of national liberation or of the right of the peoples to self-determination are aimed at encouraging nationalist fault lines in the class and subjecting the proletariat to bourgeois control. Today, anti-imperialism means proceeding against the system as a whole. The exploited and oppressed can only struggle for the liberation on the basis of class autonomy. As internationalists, we therefore recognize no solidarity with peoples, states, or nations but only with real and specific human beings and their struggles and social conf confrontations. Our aim is the struggle of the workers of all countries, as this is the sole perspective for the, for the overthrow of all oppression and discrimination. The oppression of women. Exploitation, housework, discrimination, and sexual violence. That is the daily reality for millions of proletarian women worldwide. The oppression of women has its roots in the division of society into property-owning and propertyless classes. It represents a special relation of oppression which weakens the working class as a whole. Women represent over half the world population, but perform the majority of society's work. Today, as always, the burdens of the work of reproduction, raising children and housework, are primarily carried by women. Even when the work of women is paid, the payment on average is considerably lower than it is for men. Women are always the first to feel the harshest attacks of capitalism in the form of wars, hunger, progr programs of cuts, and waves of redundancies. The bourgeoisie may talk a lot about equality laws and sexual liberation, but in reality, women are deprived of basic rights today as much as ever. They are deprived of the right of decision by laws on abortion, and even denied the right of self-determination over their own bodies. This is coupled with the propagation of a sexual morality which reduces women to their role as mothers and raises the bourgeois nuclear family to a social model. On the other hand, women's bodies and sexuality are treated at all levels of the, cu of the cultural industry as a commodity for profit whether this is in the more or less socially accepted forms in advertising or in the clearer forms like pornography and prostitution. All this contributes to the oppression of women eating into everyday bourgeois consciousness as a supposed normality and its daily reproduction on all levels of social life. In the period after the Second World War, women did experience far-reaching improvements, but these were, were only short-lived victories, which were primarily down to the economic boom and the requirements of capitalism. All of this was subject to the return of the crisis as the worsening position of women on the labor market and the various ideological campaigns, campaigns for a return to the family values show. It is true that capitalism has laid the basis for the liberation of women by enabling their entry onto the labor market and participation in social life. But nevertheless, women's oppression cannot be overcome within capitalist relations. Today, as in the past, the roots of women's oppression lie in the family, the last bastion of bourgeois property relations. 
The development of capitalism has, without doubt, weakened the institution of the family. Also, at least, and in a leading capitalist state, the most blatant excesses of patriarchal oppression can be curbed by legal regulation, like the right to divorce and the criminalizing of violence and rape within marriage. Nevertheless, capitalism is not in a position to go beyond the family as the fundamental unit of socialization. The emancipation of women can only be realized in a society in which the tasks of raising children, housework, and the care of the sick and elderly are part of a collective social activity. The emancipation of women is directly connected with the creation of a socialist society and the liberation of the working class as a whole. Nevertheless, the struggle against sexist discrimination cannot be postponed until day X after the revolution. It is a basic task of revolutionaries to work unsparingly against reactionary conceptions about and models of behavior for women. We oppose the glorification of bourgeois marriage and family, the nucleus of patriarchal oppression and discrimination on the basis of sexual orientations which do not conform to the ruling bourgeois sexual mor morality. In contrast to bourgeois feminists, we don't think that sexism can be moderated or even overcome by rules for individual behavior or even quotas imposed by the state apparatus. By ignoring the division of society into classes, feminism disguises the contradiction of interests between bourgeois and proletarian women and thus reveals itself as a reactionary cul-de-sac. The struggle, the struggle against the oppression of women is for us no affair purely for women but on the contrary, equally a means and a precondition for the production of class unity. The revolutionary organization must take all requisite steps to ensure the full participation of as many women as possible in the communist movement. There's no socialism without the liberation of women, no liberation of women without socialism. Racism. Racism, the oppression and discrimination against people on the basis of characteristics ascribed to them is one of the most repulsive manifestations of bourgeois society. It is no relic of the past or even a natural human phenomenon, but an ideology of oppression with a specific history and a particular social function. Racism evolved in the wake of colonialism and the development of the capitalist economic system. Differing from other ideologies of exclusion, the devaluation of other people was now linked with characteristics and features which were declared to be unalterable. Racism has taken on the most varied forms and facets in its history. All the same, it has continually fulfilled the same function for our rulers, that of ideologically justifying exploitation and oppression. Racism is therefore not just a moral obscenity, but on the contrary, an essential organizational principle of capitalist society. The maintenance of the structure of the capitalist economy demands that workers regard other workers as competitors for employment, accommodation, entry to educational institutions, etc. This is an important trapdoor for nationalist and racist ideas, whose effects Karl Marx was already observing in the 19th century. Every industrial and commercial centre in England now possesses a working class, divided into two hostile camps. English proletarians and Irish proletarians. The ordinary English worker hates the Irish worker as a competitor who lowers his standards of life. In relation to the Irish worker, he regards himself as a member of the ruling nation and consequently, he becomes a tool of the English aristocrats and capitalists against Ireland, thus strengthening their domination over himself. He cherishes religion, social, and national prejudices against the Irish worker. His attitude towards him is much the same as that of the poor whites to the Negroes in the former slave states of the USA. The Irishman pays him back with interest in his own money. He sees in the English worker both the accomplice and the stupid tool of the English rulers in Ireland. This antagonism is artificially kept alive and intensified by the press the pulpit, the comic papers, in short, by all the means at the disposal of the ruling class. This antagonism is the secret of the impotence of the English working class, despite its organization, 
It is the secret by which the capitalist class maintains its power. Racism in this way undermines the only way to successfully resist the daily impositions of the system, class solidarity. In spite of the internationalization of capitalism, the bourgeoisie exercises its rule in the form of national states. In opposition to this, the proletariat is an international class, a class of migrants. Every split weakens its struggle and tightens the screws of exploitation. For this reason, it is an urgent task for communists to struggle without compromise against racist ideas. Our resistance against racism has nothing to do with the patronizing reform projects of the so-called multicultural, multiculturalist propagandists who peddle all sorts of cultural recipes and, in the framework of their own positive racism, only accept those cultural differences which they consider that the local public can, di can digest. The division in the working class cannot be overcome by the foreign minority conforming to the prevailing dominant culture. We reject every positive evaluation of integration or assimilation. These kinds of concepts are always based on the bourgeois prejudice of the higher worth of some sort of national culture and language. To overcome racist divisions, a conscious minority politics for the most oppressed sectors of the class is necessary. Action without compromise against all racist shenanigans, discrimination, exceptional laws, and administrative practices is an essential basic condition for the production of class unity. The working class has neither countries nor national cultures to defend. The only way out of the treadmill of exploitation consists in the overcoming of the capitalist system, which gives birth to racism and reproduces it on a daily basis. Fascism. Fascism was one answer of the bourgeoisie to the strengthening of the class movement after the First World War. Historically, fascism unfolded as a movement of radicalized petit bourgeois who felt their existence to be threatened to the same degree by the crisis of capitalism as by the class struggles of the proletariat. By its militant behavior and a bizarre propaganda mixture of aggressive nationalism, anti-Semitism, and social demagogy, Fascism, however, achieved mass influence even outside these circles. But it was its terror against the organizations of the workers' movement rather than its reactionary eclectic program which moved parts of the bourgeoisie to harness fascist movements to their own purposes. For a crisis-ridden capitalism, fascism proved itself to be an option for rule everywhere where the class's revolutionary struggles had threatened the foundations of the system and a revival of the economy made a corporatist and centralist organization of society necessary. By nipping the struggle of the working class in the bud, by smashing every attempt at opposition, and by subjecting every area of society to state control, fascism proved itself to be a particularly authoritarian form of capital's dictatorship. The bestial crimes of fascism showed once again what inhuman brutality capitalism is capable of in the imperialist cycle of crisis and war. For this reason, it is no accident that some paid moralists of the bourgeoisie happily try to represent fascism as an anti-bourgeois revolt or as the most extreme form of bourgeois society. In the light of the almost incomprehensible horror of the Holocaust, such arguments may appear plausible at first sight. Nevertheless, they remain mystifications with which the symbiotic relationship between fascism and democracy is to be hidden. Without doubt, the fascists escalated racism to its highest extreme, but neither racism nor anti-Semitism and nationalism are exclusively fascist inventions, but on the contrary, are essential elements of capitalist society. Neither do the fascists stand outside, nor do they stand against the ruling capitalist relationships. Rather, they pick up the resentments and ideologies that our rulers spread on a daily basis, in order to intensify them in their own way. For this reason, communists combat fascism like every other form of bourgeois rule. The cul-de-sac of anti-fascism against all united fronts and people's fronts. 
For the working class, it is absolutely necessary to resist the emergence of fascists and their attacks. Even so, such a struggle can only have perspectives for success if it rests on a clear class basis. Resistance to fascism must be part of the comprehensive anti-capitalist struggle to vanquish all forms of bourgeois rule. We reject all participation in the various anti-fascist leagues and campaigns for the defense of democracy. These represent reactionary cul-de-sacs which aim at yoking the working class to the cart of democratic but still bourgeois states. The whole logic of anti-fascism is to resist fascism by defending the democratic state as the lesser evil. The conception of wanting to defend democracy comes down to accepting, promoting, and in the end, succumbing to the myth of the state as a class neutral entity. It means strengthening the state, subjecting oneself to its power, and robbing oneself of every possibility of self-activity. In the end, this means nothing more than chaining the proletariat to the state and delivering, its defenseless, delivering it defenseless to repression. Consequently, anti-fascism always, always fails where it claims to be effective, preventing the transformation of democracy into a dictatorship through the broadest possible alliance of all do-gooders. All attempts to dress up the state as revolutionary end either in the scandal of the state presenting itself as the best anti-fascist or in a catastrophe if, in the name of anti-fascist unity, the revolution is given up. As an ideology glorifying the state and a practical route to the renunciation of revolution, anti-fascism is just as much directed against the proletariat as is fascism. Those who wish to settle with fascism must fight anti-fascism and vice versa. The alternative which stands before humanity in the light of capitalism's power for destructive development is not democracy or fascism, but socialism or barbarism. Chapter 4. False Friends False friends are sometimes the worst enemies. In order to maintain its rule, capitalism supports itself on a series of organizations and currents which profess to wish to improve the position of the working class, but in reality work to direct all resistance into cul-de-sacs and thus make it harmless. In order to successfully carry out a struggle for its interests, the proletariat must become aware of its historical tasks and give all these forces a clear rejection. Unions, or the unions. Trade unions work well as centers of resistance against the encroachments of capital. They fail partially from an in injudish fuck, injudicious use of their power. They fail generally from limiting themselves to a guerrilla war against the effect of the existing system, instead of simultaneously trying to change it instead of using their organized forces as a lever for the final emancipation of the working class, that is to say the ultimate abolition of the wages system. Marx wrote this in 1865. Today we can only declare the absolute failure of the unions to even defend the most basic interests of the workers. Their transformation from centers of resistance against the encroachments of capital to state supporting bureau bureaucratic apparatuses is irreversible. Taken by themselves, unions were never revolutionary. They emerged as workers in specific branches of the economy united to fight for better conditions. For this reason, they were initially combated by the bourgeois state with all the means at its disposal and sometimes even banned. After much sacrifice and thanks to the solidarity of the working class, they were finally recognized as legal organizations. Increasingly, a tendency for the unions to subordinate themselves to the logic of capitalism permeated these organizations. With the development of imperialism, they became an integral component part of bourgeois rule. Their elixir of life consisted and consists still in negotiating the conditions of the sale of the, of the labor power commodity to the bosses. This only makes sense on the basis of the political acceptance of the wages system and within the framework of the capitalist national economy. 
As early as the First World War, the unions, in agreement with the Social Democratic leadership, supported an imperialist war. They proclaimed the Bergfrieden civil peace with the ruling class and collaborated in the implement implementation of anti-strike laws. To the same degree, the militarization of labor, the intensification of work, the lengthening of the working day and wage cuts found their willing support. Since then, the unions have continually acted as the defenders of the ruling order. From their position as the supposed representatives of the working class, they are, they are enabled to sell restructuring, i.e. redundancies, realistic wage agreements, which usually contain wage cuts, etc., as being in the interest of economic sense. It is always the unions which scream the loudest for protectionism and import controls in order to save jobs. The unions have a manifold repertoire of methods to domesticate and control workers' struggles and to lead them into dead ends. By isolating and selling out strikes, dividing workers into groups by industry and occupation, preventing and sabotaging effective forms of struggle, they try to make sure that the rule of capital is not seriously challenged. Anyone on the left who continually explains the union's actions by the treachery of the current leadership which should be replaced by a different one in order to improve the unions, marks themselves out by a thought process which is as naive as it is idealist. This kind of thinking reduces all problems to the question of the right people in strategic positions, and which all too often turns out to be a desire for posts and state support, hedged around with Leninist clauses. The unions cannot be reformed, reconquered, or be transformed into instruments of liberation. The problem is not simply one of this or that leadership. It is the organizational form of the unions itself, based on representative politics, that stands opposed to a perspective of workers' emancipation. Unions betray nothing and no one, least of all themselves. If they sabotage struggles, take us for a ride, and in this way make themselves indispensable to capital as factors for negotiation and order, they are only acting consistently and logically in agreement with their original concerns, wishing to negotiate the business conditions of the sale of the labor power commodity with the capitalists on the same level. This does not mean that we simply call for leaving the unions or for membership cards to be torn up, which would be just the same as many of the illusions of participation encouraged in the unions. The old quarrel about whether private legal costs, insurance, or union membership offers the best protection from sacking and the whims of the employer is a debate about bogus solutions. As long as workers confront the boss alone and isolated and hope to receive protection from above in this desperate situation, things usually end badly. We do not call for the construction of new and better unions which sooner or later will end in exactly the same politics of representation as the old ones. Permanent economic organizations of the working class must enter into negotiations with the capitalists and thus sooner or later accept the rules of the game of the system of exploitation. At, be at best, this kind of a syndicalist experiment would merely repeat the history of the last 200 years in double quick time. The main issue is to understand that the union's framework for action, legalistic and fixated on the state, is a straitjacket which continually subordinates resistance and combat combativity to bourgeois economy, bourgeois right and bourgeois law. In order to be able to carry out its struggle for its long-term goals, the working class must go beyond the union framework. Strikes, not unions, are today's schools of socialism. This is particularly true when they bring together workers from different branches and are led by strict committees of elected and recallable delegates who are responsible to full assemblies of the workers. The sole alternative to the unions consists of the self-organization of the struggle, autonomy from below. The task of revolutionaries consists of struggling for the communist perspective everywhere that the working class is to be met, including in union meetings. In the present phase of capitalism, even defensive struggles against job losses and wage cuts rapidly, rapidly come up against the limits of the system. 
not putting the question of the system and or excluding the question of the power of control of the means of production, means answering it in the sense of the unions and accepting worsening conditions and sacrifice. Communists must actively take part in struggles which have the potential to go beyond the limitations of the mainly economic struggles and take all necessary steps to organize the workers around the revolutionary program. Social Democracy The Second International was founded in 1889 at a time when its biggest section, German Social Democracy, was still struggling against Bismarck's anti-socialist laws. In reality, it functioned more as a federation of national social democratic parties which adopted the only non-binding resolutions. All its parties were based on a reformist minimal program and a formal maximum program which abstractly declared itself for socialism, behind which it was able to hide its reformist daily practice. It is true that the social democratic parties developed into mass orga organizations, but this was at the price of their progressive integration into the bourgeois order. Belief in parliamentarism necessarily led to accommodation with, and finally submission to, bourgeois public order. The bureaucracy which emerged insidiously placed maintaining the organization and its finances above its socialist principles, which were increasingly reduced in importance except in the parties sermonizing. Reformism led necessarily to loyalty to the imperialist national state, which the which the reformists wanted to take over. In 1914, against all their previous anti-war resolutions, the Social Democratic parties largely supported the war aims of their respective bourgeoisies. In the light of the Second International's previously adopted anti-war resolutions, this was an open betrayal of all principles. Fundamentally, support for imperialist war was only the logical consequence of the practice followed up until that point. The Bergfrieden, sealed with the bourgeoisie in August 1914, was, in the final analysis, also an indicator of how far social democracy had become an elementary constituent part of the bourgeois order. From then on, the social democratic parties evolved into major supporters of capitalism. Between 1918 and 1923, social democracy played a leading role in smashing the revolutionary workers' uprisings and in the murder of thousands of communists, including Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht. Today, social democracy acts as the advocate of a reformism without real reforms. By continuing to sow illusions in Parliament, selling cuts as either a regretful necessity or just a lesser evil, it attempts to chain the working class to the state. In periods of strong class struggle, it plays a central role in the defense of capitalism, by claiming to be a workers' party. In times of class peace, it spreads the illusion that the workers have a choice in elections. Social democracy is an important ideological prop for capitalism and cannot be won back to the camp of the working class. Stalinism. The Russian Revolution was already long defeated before Stalin became the undisputed leader of the USSR in 1928. The degeneration of the Russian October Revolution resulted from the defeat of the worldwide class movement and the consequent weakness in defending the hard-fought stirrings of workers' power against the Stalinist counter-revolution. Stalinism did not represent the logical result of the Bolshevik Revolution, but, on the contrary, it was a total break with all its hopes and efforts. Instead of freedom for the working class, Stalin and or the developing capitalist class, whose representative he was, developed a party dictatorship of unprecedented cruelty. Instead of communism, a particularly brutal variant of state capitalism developed. While the basis for capitalist society, commodity production and wage labor was preserved, all embracing state control and forced labor were lyingly painted as socialist achievements. Proletarians remained wage laborers with no power of disposal over the means of production, which were concentrated in the hands of the state. Stalinism was able to triumph in Russia because it was a question of an essential, an especially retrograde, retrograde country. 
In a certain sense, he anticipated certain elements of the mixed economy, which emerged in the West after, after the Second World War. Here too, it was claimed that the nationalized industries were the people's property. Primarily, however, it was an exceptional capitalist formation, which evolved in a unique context. It became a model for a series of countries such as Cuba or China, as well as various nationalist movements which inflicted severe defeats on the proletariat. As a form of rule and as a political current, Stalinism acted on the basis of a nationalist and state capitalist program. Subjection of the proletariat to the state, terror, renunciation of revolution, and the mass murder of communists. Its totally reactionary character revealed itself in the cultivation of nationalism and anti-Semitism, and the propagation of a sexual morality hostile to women and the glorification of wage labor. It was not a somehow degenerated socialist experiment, but on the contrary, the grave digger of the revolution, an especially perfidious variant of, of anti-communism. Heirs of the counter-revolution, the left of capital. The tradition of all dead generation generations weighs like a nightmare on the brains of the living. Today, there are there are a bewildering number of groups and organizations calling themselves socialist or communist. For the majority of them, it is sometimes a question of unintentionally comical attempts to reinvent social democracy or to reanimate Stalinism. But the confusion and damage that these groups cause in the name of Marxism is considerable. Most of these groups construct their programs by equating socialism with the state ownership of the means of production. At the end of the day, this is a reactionary position which cannot be equated with revolutionary Marxism, and which Frederick Engels had already denounced. The modern state, whatever its form, is an essentially capitalist machine. It is the state of the capitalists, the ideal collective body of all capitalists. The more productive forces it takes over, the more it becomes the real collective body of all the capitalists, the more citizens it exploits. The workers remain wage earners, proletarians. The capitalist relationship is not abolished. It is rather pushed to an extreme. There has never been a socialist revolution in China, Vietnam, Cuba, or North Korea. In these countries, a social upheaval, which was the work of the working class, has never happened. Nor has a proletariat organized in councils ever had the possibility of making political or economic de decisions there. For this reason, we draw a clear dividing line between us and those who wish to ascribe to these regimes of exploitation a progressive, anti-capitalist, or even socialist character. Maoism, like Guevarism, represents an anti-communist current directed against the working class, which relies on the same ideological premises as Stalinism. The People's Front concept, the stages theory, the glorification of the state, nationalism, etc. The various Trotskyist currents like to use the prestige of the opposition to Stalin led by Leon Trotsky to make themselves look good. But apart from the fact that Trotsky's struggle developed fairly late, he was always hamstrung by the fact that he confused state capitalism with social socialism and regarded the Communist Party as the exclusive arena for political confrontation. Trotsky interpreted the guidelines decided by the first four Congresses of the Common Turn as the basis for revolutionary politics. Consistent with this, he accepted the fatal notion that social democracy was a proletarian current, with which one could seal agreements in leagues, so-called united fronts. The reactionary consequences of this way of seeing things revealed itself in 1935, when he instructed its followers to enter the social democratic parties. This was the basis of so-called entryism, that is, the collaboration of Trotskyists with social democracy, the force that had supported the imperialist war and bloodily defeated the proletariat's uprisings. In the transitional program of the Fourth International, which was written by Trotsky in 1938, his deeply idealist method found its most striking expression. Essentially, the so-called transitional program was nothing more or less than a return to social democracy's concept of the minimal program. It expressed especially clearly the deeply rooted belief of Trotskyists 
that they could draw out a revolutionary consciousness through a series of reformist demands. Briefly, that is a politics which rests on manipulation and denies the working class the capacity to arrive at communist consciousness through its own struggles. On top of this, Trotsky and his followers continued all the confusion of the early common turn on the question of imperialism and so-called national self-determination. This ended in leading them to take sides in various local imperialist conflicts, the Spanish Civil War, Abyss Abyssinia, the Sino-Japanese War, and finally to participate in the imperialist Second World War as a defender of democracy and the socialist fatherland. Trotskyism today represents nothing more or less than a state capitalist current, which must be decisively criticized and combated by internationalist revolutionaries. Although the various Trotskyist, Stalinist, and Maoist currents have their differences, they are all part of what we call the capitalist left. They all stand for alliances with the forces of the bourgeoisie, support of nationalism, and the more or less critical defense of Stalinism. All of their concepts, programs, and tactics have broken the back of proletarian struggles more than once. It is not therefore a question of carrying on with the same old stuff in the name of left unity, but on the contrary of a clear political break in order to have a clear vision of the perspective of class struggle across borders. Chapter five, the tasks of revolutionaries. Today, communists face great difficulties and challenges. The domination of bourgeois ideology has led to a marked separation between the working class and its revolutionary minorities. Although the working class is more international and larger than ever before, and although the globalization of production provides the basis for unification, today the class is more fragmented and disoriented or disorientated than ever before in its history. At the same time, we face a mighty international enemy with the greatest reserves of wealth and power, and the bourgeoisie has learnt from its history too. It knows every trick to divide the working class and so to maintain its rotten system, but it cannot solve the objective contradictions of capitalism. The growing barbarism of capitalism in its imperialist epoch represents the material basis for its final overthrow by the working class. The task of revolutionaries is to keep the interests of the working class as a whole in view by supporting its struggles, by criticizing its limitations, and by trying to strengthen wage laborers' trust in and consciousness of their own strength. Revolutionary politics develops when revolutionaries are in a position to learn from the struggles of the class, to generalize experiences of, of struggle and to carry consciousness and perspectives to the movement. Whenever they can, revolutionaries must take practical initiatives in this regard. But as long as capitalism exists, victories in economic and political struggles can only be temporary. The emancipation of the working class demands a political struggle for power. Communists must mercilessly unmask and combat all bourgeois organizations which strive to shift class struggle to ground which is secure for the capitalists. This demands, as has already been explained, an, organiza an organizational framework. According to our understanding, this can only be an international and internationalist revolutionary organization. International because capitalism can only be combated and overcome on a global level. Internationalist because the rejection of all nationalist ideology is the basis for the production of class unity. Revolutionary because it is only in the radical break with capitalism that there lies the perspective for living a life not just in humane conditions, but simply as a human being. The need for a revolutionary break. None of humanity's global problems like hunger, destruction of the environment, and the growing danger of war can be tackled within the framework of the capitalist profit system, let alone solved. The working class cannot fundamentally change its social situation so long as the bourgeoisie commands political power through an intact state apparatus. 
All attempts by the workers' movement to develop the structures of production resting on common property through the formation of retail cooperatives or self-managed concerns have continually been shipwrecked on the political and economic realities of capitalism. <clears throat> While the up-and-coming bourgeoisie can make <clears throat> treaties and temporary alliances with the feudal classes, the proletariat can only free itself through intransigent class struggle. In distinction to the rising bourgeoisie, the proletariat must first conquer political and economic power before it can seriously change anything in its social position. Capitalism can neither be gradually improved, progressively and essentially altered, or managed humanely. Against representation for delegation. All reformist attempts to tame capitalism through compromises with our rulers have proved themselves to be disastrous dead ends. There's no parliamentary road to socialism. Parliament long ago lost the role given to it by the bourgeois revolutions of the 19th century, that of being the central organ of arbitration between classes. While the real decisions are taken in closed committees of the state apparatus, parliamentarism today has the primary ideological function for our rulers of cloaking the deeds of the government in democratic clothes. Parliamentarism, in addition, has a structural function to integrate us into capitalist life. Every parliamentary or orientation leads sooner or later to the desire to co-manage the things necessary for capitalism in conformity with public opinion. As a classical variant of representation, parliamentarism stands in the way of the single feasible way to alter society, the self-activity of the working class. It is, it is just the same with the operation of small armed groups in the form of terrorism or guerrilla warfare. Individual terror reflects the voluntarist mentality of the radicalized petit bourgeoisie. It is in most cases a product of the machinations of bourgeois secret services and a favorite field of play for inter-imperialist confrontation. Isolated actions by terrorist groups are completely unsuitable to challenge bourgeois rule. They place the proletariat in the role of a passive onlooker and impart the illusion that others can act in the place of the working class in achieving change. The account that the international working class has to settle with capitalism is too comprehensive to hand over to a few of this system's functionaries and characters. The struggle for liberation cannot be delegated to self-nominated elites or, or ever so well-meaning vanguards. The overthrow of this system requires the solidly united self-activity of the masses. As an expression of self-emancipation of the working class, communism rejects the idea of a state which supposedly has the right to rule over us and suppress us. Workers' democracy instead of party dictatorship. The experience of the Paris Commune long ago showed that the working class cannot take over the structures of the bourgeois state apparatus and use it for its own purposes. The bourgeois state is not an institution hovering above classes, but is, on the contrary, an organ of repression and control for the maintenance and defense of the rule of capital. It must be smashed in a revolutionary way and replaced by the organs of the proletarian self-organization. The historically discovered form and driving force of this revolutionary transformation process towards communism is the councils. The councils are no abstract invention of socialist theoreticians, but on the contrary, are thrown up again and again by the struggles and uprisings of the working class. It is no accident that our ruler's propaganda machine either keeps quiet about the history hold on, of the councils or distorts it. The inspirational examples of the councils show how millions of people can take their lives in their own hands and run them themselves. In contrast to bourgeois democracy, which rests on representation and passivity, the councils base themselves on working class self-activity. The principle is the electability and recallability of delegates at any time the duty of office holders to account for themselves and control from below. The historical experience has, however, also shown 
that even the most complete council democracy by itself is no guarantee for the development of socialism. Exactly as communists must give an orientation towards the smashing of the bourgeois state before the proletarian conquest of power, at the time of the transition period they must struggle for suitable measures to prepare the end of capitalist commodity production on a world scale. The organization of revolutionaries must do justice to their political responsibility towards the class. Its task consists of combining and generalizing the spontaneous movements of the working class, but not to dictate or impose any doctrinaire system whatsoever. <clears throat> they should not fear to struggle, even as a minority, for the communist program inside and, when necessary, outside the councils. On the other hand, they should not act in the place of the class, usurp the councils, or merge with the structures of the proletarian semi-state. Neither the revolutionary party nor the councils taken by themselves represent a guarantee against counter-revolution. The only guarantee of victory lies in the initiative and living class consciousness of the international proletariat. The International Dimension The overthrow of capitalism cannot be completed overnight. But as soon as the working class overthrows the ruling class in a country or territory, the period of transition towards communism begins. The proletariat must use the political power it has conquered and smash the bourgeois state apparatus, disempower the bourgeoisie and introduce the first steps towards the socialization of the means of production. This demands the establishment of a revolutionary regime on the basis of workers' councils. As an international system, however, capitalism can only be fought and overcome on an international level. Socialism cannot be constructed in a single country or territory. A so-called worker state or the dictatorship of the proletariat is, in the first instance, a political category. Nevertheless, a worker state will take measures for the improvement of the conditions of life of the working class reduction in the working day, free access to the health and education system, etc., and try to direct production for the needs of society. But these measures are, in any case, milestones for a socialist future. As long as the capitalists have the crisis in hand to some extent and can keep workers' struggles on a bourgeois terrain and isolated, their rule is relatively secure. As long as capitalist commodity production in the rest of the world continues to exist, the dictate of the law of value holds. Just as an isolated strike or factory occupation can only be maintained for a limited time, a worker's state in a hostile environment cannot survive for long. Either world capitalism will destroy the revolutionary experiment by military means, or it will place it under enormous economic pressure, or both. This would have the consequence that a proletarian regime, as in the case of Bolshevik Russia, would be forced to compete with the bourgeois state, states under capitalist conditions. <clears throat> this would sooner or later lead to a competitive struggle over the accumulation of capital and block any socialist perspective. The highest priority of a proletarian regime and of a communist world party therefore lies in the extension and consolidation of the revolution internationally. Only when capitalism has been defeated across the world will it be possible to undertake real steps towards socialism. Beyond the state, nation, and capital. The establishment of a society which puts an end to the exploitation of people by people is a long and difficult process, which demands the solution of a series of extremely complex problems. One great challenge will be to meet the dramatic consequences of capitalist exploitation of both people and the environment. Capitalism has nevertheless also brought about an unprecedented level of social wealth and technological innovation. The overthrow of the bourgeoisie and the takeover of production by the producers will open up great possibilities of development. The entire potential of science, research, and technology would be able to be used for the benefit of humanity. It would no longer serve short-sighted profit motives, but on the contrary would solve real problems. Production and distribution would be oriented towards the needs of people. Society's work would be more fairly divided and could be decisively reduced. Art, culture, and science could freely develop and would no longer be the privilege of certain social classes. 
on the basis of material security, freedom, and social equality. For the first time in the history of humanity, the formation of real individuality would be possible. As classes and class contradictions are overcome, the structures of the proletarian semi-state would become superfluous and wither away. The government of persons can be replaced by the administration of things. But a socialist society can only be spoken of when commodity production, classes, and states have disappeared on a world level. Only then can the association of the free and equal become a reality, and the free development of each the condition for the free development of all.